Christopher Edelstein has worked in medicine for 22 years and has worked at Stony Brook Eastern Long Island Hospital as the lead emergency room PA for 11 years. Christopher Edelstein grew up in Nassau County, New York, in West Hempstead in Long Beach. Christopher Edelstein got his undergraduate degree at Hofstra University and his PA degree at Toro University in Bayshore. His master's degree at University of Nebraska and his doctoral degree at University of Lynchburg in Virginia. Dr. Edelstein's concentration is on COVID and emergency medicine. He lives on Long Island, is married, and has a 10-year-old daughter. Thank you so much. Welcome, Dr. Edelstein. Oh. Oh. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Chris Edelstein. I'm a PA at East Long Island Emergency Room. Uh, I guess we'll just go over when to go to the ER versus calling your doctor versus urgent care and hopefully answer some questions on um, when we feel or you feel that what's an emergency versus a doctor's visit or a phone call. All right, so a couple of terms that are associated with the ER. So ER is emergency room. Uh, EM stands for emergency medicine. ED is for emergency department. Um, we're governed by the American College of Emergency Physicians, uh, which is a governing board that has um, statutes and algorithms and flow charts for what we can cons constitute an emergency and how to best care for, for the public. Um, as also, you can see multiple ER shows on TV, uh, so that might glorify or dramatize when to go to an ER. Uh, Big Farm uh, is, as you can see on your commercials, for uh, all the drugs and different uh, medical devices to help with uh, infections or heart rate, stuff like that. So um, at Eastern Long Island Emergency Room, we are called a critical access hospital. So we have an ER, um, and we do have a floor where people could be admitted but we're kind of limited in what specialties we have to offer. Some places just have what they call a standalone ER or an ED, where it would just be the emergency department. So if we needed to admit you or if you needed surgery or anything else, we would have to transfer you to a hospital that had uh, inpatient services, almost like Stony Brook, Maine if you needed uh, a specialty that we didn't offer at East Long Island ER. And urgent care, which uh, I think there's one in Kutchog um, and some other ones, and uh, we'll go over the difference between an ER and an urgent care and when to figure out which one is good for you. So again, I work at East Long Island ER, uh, one of the PAs there, working along with all the doctors. Um, you also obviously will run into nurses, um, ER techs that might do your EKG or help you to the bathroom or collect some blood or urine samples, uh, radiology for x-rays and pulmonology if you need any help with breathing treatments or oxygen. So if you come to the emergency room, whether it's for, as we're going to go over chest pain or a cut. Sometimes we can't come up with the definitive diagnosis of say, hey, you have bronchitis or you have pneumonia, but the main thing is to make sure that we're ruling out anything life-threatening or catastrophic or, or making sure that we're not sending you home with a, a God forbid an illness that we can't figure out. So sometimes you might not get a definitive diagnosis. We could say you have a virus, but we can't tell you definitively what it is. We could say you don't have COVID or you don't have the flu, but sometimes the testing won't yield us to say exactly what you have. All right, so like we were saying, in our ER here, we have ER doctors, PAs, nurses, respiratory therapists, PCAs or patient care associates that help you with uh, some daily tasks during your stay in the ED. Um, radiology text that will get pictures of your chest or your arms or, if, God forbid, if you have anything broken. Uh, the lab texts run your bloods and they report to us. 
and the pharmacists will help with um, your medications and our medications to make sure that we're not giving you something that has an interaction or you have an allergy to. Any questions yet? Everybody good? Oh, okay. Uh, I guess you want to hold off until the end? Okay, sure. Okay, so here's just a little uh, type of diagram. So I stepped on a bee that might be handled at an urgent care, even though if you're allergic to bees and you need an EpiPen or something called anaphylaxis, you do need to go to the ER. Versus if somebody stepped on a beehive or got stung by multiple bees, that's definitely an emergency room visit because that could definitely compromise your breathing uh, as well as your circulation. So the difference is they can handle a bee sting at an urgent care as long as you don't have a history of having what they call anaphylaxis. But if you step on a beehive and are bombarded by bee stings, that might be um, an emergency room visit to be better handled. You might need an IV, some fluids and medications that an urgent care couldn't do. All right, so let's go over when we should start thinking about going to the ER. So the term prudent layperson is just a broad term to say if, God forbid, you cut your finger off, that might, we should all know that's probably something that we need to go to the ER for, that your regular doctor's office probably couldn't handle it or a phone call to your doctor wouldn't be able to handle it. So they kind of consider that what they say, we should all be a prudent layperson to know what is an extreme emergency where we really need to go to the ER. <clears throat> Exactly. We'll go over that for sure. But yes, I mean, um, we'll go over what that is. But if, if your care or if a place you want to go is closed, our ER is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So that would be the, that would be the obvious choice. Um, so at Eli, we do have a, a pretty robust uh, psychological uh, services. So anyone with severe depression or thoughts of suicide, God forbid, that would not be something that could be handled, let's say, in a doctor's office or in urgent care. So that would definitely be an ER visit uh, for a mental health crisis, which we are uh, well prepared to take care of. We have psych residents now as well as uh, a psych floor. <clears throat> so I'm pretty sure this is a, a common answer uh, question, which I think somebody asked before. So wounds that need closure. So we all get cuts and scrapes and abrasions. So a cut that they say is greater than like what they say, one centimeter, which might be like a little, like a half an inch. If it's uncontrolled bleeding, because some of us are on blood thinners like Coumadin or Xarelto or Eliquis, that might be a reason to go to the ER. Uh, if we have diabetes, that might go to the ER because you might need antibiotics. And if it's over an area that won't close, so if you got cut on your finger right here and you keep doing that and it keeps opening and closing, you might need stitches. <clears throat> now, could this be seen at an urgent care? Sure, but if it's closed, like this gentleman was saying, we are more than welcome to uh, close wounds, treat them antibiotics, and, and uh, take it from there, as well as to make sure there's no foreign bodies in there. Sometimes if you break a glass, there could be a piece of glass in there that you don't know of, so we would get an x-ray to make sure there's nothing stuck in the wound. <clears throat> All right, so uncontrolled bleeding. So <clears throat> this happens a lot with, again, blood thinners, Coumadin, Eliquis, Xarelto, Aspirin, Plavix. So sometimes even now with the cold weather, you could get an uncontrolled nosebleed. Um, you could be coughing up blood, which might be a sign of an infection or God forbid something worse. Uh, you could be bleeding in your urine or uh, rectally, like a GI bleed, uh, which might come from something called like diverticulitis or uh, 
like a perforated uh, peptic ulcer, which would only really be taken care of at the emergency room. So we would need to make sure that you're not anemic, that your coumadin levels are, are high or low, and you might need some IV uh, support as well as a specialist to be seen. So this would not be seen at your doctor's office or in urgent care. It would have to be seen in the emergency room. Good? Okay. <clears throat> so head trauma, right, or trauma in general. Um, you know, if you're banging your head uh, like on a book or you just, you know, you, you bumped into something, that might not need an emergent care. But if you, if you fall from a standing height, if you fall from a couple of steps, if you fall out of bed onto a concrete floor, and again, if you're on all those medications that are prone to you bleeding, that might need us to take a look at you to get a CAT scan of your head to make sure that you don't have any bleeding inside. Chest pain, that's a big one. Um, chest pain could be anything. It could be jaw pain, it could be shoulder pain, it could be chest pain. Um, but there's really only a couple of ways to make sure that it's nothing dangerous. And that's either getting an EKG or checking bloods to make sure your heart bloods aren't elevated. <clears throat> now you can get an EKG at your doctor's office as well as the urgent care, but they won't get your blood back. So for chest pain, I would personally yield to go to the emergency room. If it's nothing, it's nothing and you go home. But uh, at least you're in an area where we could take care of you, God forbid, it's something serious. Back pain, that's another thing. Um, back pain could be seen at your doctor's office. It could be seen at your urgent care. But it would be something like if you bent over to pick up a book and you felt a strain, fine. That might just be a back strain. But if you're having a back pain that goes to your belly, or if you have numbness in your legs, if you can't urinate, if you can't control your bowel movements, or if you're numb, that's an emergency room visit because that might mean that there's pinching on a nerve or you might have what they call an aneurysm, which would not be seen in your doctor's office or your urgent care. <clears throat> uh, abdominal pain. Um, for the most part, most of the people we see that do go to their doctor's office or the urgent care with belly pain, they get sent to us anyway because there's only so much they could do other than maybe checking your urine uh, at an urgent care or a doctor's office. So you might need lab work or a CAT scan to make sure you don't have appendicitis or diverticulitis. So uh, abdominal pain is probably best served at the ER. Broken bones, um, again, going with falling. Um, Unfortunately, hip fractures are very common with falls, so uh, that cannot be taken care of at the urgent care or a doctor's office. So you would need x-rays as well, an orthopedic uh, consult, which we do have at East Long Island ER. A finger fracture or a wrist fracture, you could probably be seen at an urgent care where they could put a splint on it, but anything like, like your long bone here, your hip, or if it involved a trauma, like a fall from a height, that would probably be best served with us at the uh, emergency room. Okay. <clears throat> so, like before, so do you need antibiotics or do you need anti-venom? Sorry, I, my, my voice. If you have a cough or a cold, you can be seen by your doctor or in urgent care. Uh, they can determine if you need antibiotics by mouth. If you need antibiotics from an IV, they will probably send you to us because then you need blood work, blood cultures, chest x-ray, urinalysis, or whatever they think the infection is. <clears throat> but most doctor's offices will not start an IV and give you IV antibiotics. And if you need IV antibiotics, you probably need to be admitted, and that would be through the hospital. Antivenom, of course, that would be the emergency room. Not that we have many rattlesnakes or poisonous animals here, but um, any ingestion of every, any toxic substance or any exposure 
to anything poisonous that would be uh, in emergent care, as well as poison control to be involved. <clears throat> okay, fever. So what is a fever? A fever, they say, is anything over 100.4 without taking Tylenol or Motrin. So this could be the first signs of something called sepsis. Like we were saying, it could be pneumonia or urinary infection, um, a cellulitis or a skin infection. Um, fever in different age groups means different things. Uh, a child could have a fever up to 104. It's high, but it's something that we don't get along with. Whereas adults, if we have a fever of 104, uh, that's pretty serious. It means there's something wrong and something is brewing. So uh, at the ER, we do blood work, blood cultures, cultures of uh, your urine, as well as chest x-rays and try to pinpoint what exactly we're treating. Or we give something called uh, broad spectrum antibiotics, which covers pretty much everything because like we said on the prior slide, we might, know, we might not know exactly what's wrong, but we're preparing for the worst. Okay. So, <clears throat> so sudden severe pain is really never a good thing. So what they call is like a thunderclap headache, which comes on like that, like a thunderclap. That is what we consider an emergency to make sure there's no bleeding inside your head, uh, especially if you're on all those medications we spoke about uh, before, the Coumadin, the Eloquis, and the Xarelto. And that's usually without trauma. So if you're just sitting and talking and all of a sudden you got a severe headache that you never had before, that should be considered an emergency. So it could be an aneurysm, it could be a stroke. So that would need imaging like a CAT scan or an MRI of your head. <clears throat> abdominal pain, uh, again, that could be, God forbid, an aneurysm, like an abdominal aneurysm. Uh, usually appendicitis or diverticulitis doesn't come on suddenly, uh, but it could also mean some compromise of blood flow, God forbid, to one of your organs, or it could be a kidney stone. But that would only be seen with a CAT scan, which, again, could only be done at an ER, not at your doctor's office or your urgent care. And back pain, like we said before, it could either be um, a fracture from sneezing, it could be a nerve issue, or it could be um, an aneurysm, which would need imaging. So acute allergic reactions. So like we said before, if you stepped on a bee and you know you have a prior allergy that needs an EpiPen where you turn red and you can't breathe and your voice sounds hoarse, that's the ER. Or if you are allergic to nuts and some, somebody or you ate something by mistake that had nuts and you felt like your throat might be closing, that's an ER visit where we could uh, monitor your heart rate, your breathing, and administer uh, epinephrine to reverse the, re the reaction. <clears throat> Shortness of breath. <laughs> so this is a broad term. Um, it could either be that you have congestive heart failure, you have pneumonia, you have the flu, COVID, heart issues, um, but it is kind of, could be, it can be seen at your doctor's office or in urgent care depending on how severe, uh, but either the physician or the PA at those places will probably either refer to us or send you to us to get more definitive care, whether it's an x-ray, or blood work. I think Kutchog every now and then has x-ray, so from what I understand. So if they don't have an x-ray, they might send you here to get a chest x-ray. But shortness of breath, whether it's new or old or with movement or not, needs further workup that might not be done in your doctor's office or your urgent care. Uh, chest pain, like we were saying. Uh, chest pain, I think, overall, is best seen in the emergency room unless you had like a, a rash or a pimple here that's causing the pain. But chest pain needs to be done properly with a, an EKG, chest x-ray, and lab work, uh, especially as we get older. No, 
no, that's uh, City MD. But we know them because they sent people to us. So if, let's say, somebody had chest pain and went to cut shock, they could do an EKG. Um, but if they saw something funny on the EKG, they would call us and either send an ambulance or have the patient or the patient with the family drive to us where we would then take it from there and start the process of blood work, aspirin or whatever is needed or indicated. So new neurological deficits or if you woke up, your face was drooping or your speech was slurred or you couldn't move your arm and you were concerned about a stroke, that's obviously a 911 call. Um, whether or not they might take you to us versus going up island because we're not a stroke center, um, but we do have MRI and we do have CAT scans. So that will definitely bypass your doctor's office and urgent care to make sure that you're not having either a TIA or a CVA or a stroke. So here's another type of thing. If you step on a mouse trap and you hurt your toe, you could probably go to the urgent care, but a, a bear trap that took some of your fingers off, it, it might be best with us. <laughs> okay, so when do we call 911? Um, definitely the neurological deficits, if you woke up or if you start experiencing signs and symptoms of a stroke, uh, that's, a, that's a 911 call. If you're in extreme pain and you can't drive or there's nobody to drive you, that's definitely a 911 call. Um, the other benefit of 911 is they call us prior to you getting there. So we will have room ready for you as well as one of us or a nurse preparing for your arrival, whether if it's your bleeding or chest pain or shortness of breath. So it gives us time to get prepared for you to come, whether it's five or 10 minutes. And it's a safer uh, mode of transportation. <clears throat> so like we were saying before, there's certain things that some people tend to wait to see or they're not 100% sure on when to go to see how they feel in the morning. Uh, there's fever, high blood pressure. If you do have high blood pressure or you missed one of your medications, you could probably take your medication and call your doctor. Um, but if you have super high blood pressure with a headache or shortness of breath, that's something that should not wait to the morning. Uh, a rash, that could probably be seen by your doctor unless, like we were saying, it's involving your airway or you're just uncontrolled itching or it's spreading. Uh, substance abuse and dependency, we do have detox there, but uh, that's, that's something that is sort of, um, if somebody's in withdrawal from alcohol, that could be very dangerous and that needs to be seen and taken care of as well. You personally? No, that would be 911. So if you call 911 and they come to get you, they call, 911 calls us. Well, we're going to go over that, but um, no, not really. Because most of the time, it's so busy, no one's going to get to the phone. And if you are having an emergency, 911 is the best bet. And then the paramedics will call us and tell us. There's a certain like, language that we have so they could pretty much tell us exactly like in 30 seconds what's going on. <clears throat> so if you do have time to gather stuff before going to the ER, we really would like uh, an updated medication list because uh, a lot of medications can cause problems or medications that we want to give you might interact with some of the medications that you already take. So sometimes it's hard to track down. We might have to call the pharmacy that you go to to get your list, but if they're closed, then we're kind of out of luck. Uh, telephone numbers of your doctors, because they know you the best. Uh, any advanced directives that are in place or you have. Um, healthcare proxies that might know your wishes or have other information uh, that saw you, let's say, God forbid you had a stroke, but somebody saw you the other day, we could at least get a time uh, that you were last known well. 
uh, a vial of life is um, sort of a container of pertinent medication. God forbid you can't speak or give us any information. So that give us more information to uh, yield your best care. And of course, patients, because the ER could either be busy or not, so it's, it's hours upon hours sometimes. So like we were saying, um, for, minor thing, for minor complaints, uh, you could always call your doctor. Uh, they'll always get on the phone and give you advice whether you should or should not go to the ER or if they could see you that day. Um, they do know you, they do have your charts. So if it was shortness of breath, but they know you have shortness of breath, they might not think that this is something that's acute where it's been known that you have that. Um, the urgent care, like we were saying, um, it is a uh, walk-in. Um, I know they have been busy and there is a wait, um, but they don't have any uh, specialists and they might refer you to the ER like we were saying before. So other than like a simple laceration or uh, you might need a tetanus shot, um, sometimes if it's shortness of breath, chest pain, back pain, belly pain, they might tell you to go to uh, the ER to be evaluated. So Stony Brook, which is us, as well as the main Stony Brook, there's also South Hampton, and they're building one in East Hampton. We all share the same computer system. So uh, if you went to Stony Brook, Maine last week or last month, and then you come to us, we could look up your records and see what your course of stay was and get all the uh, consultants to give us better information on how to treat you properly. As well as we do have, uh, Stony Brook has some of the best consultants um, in New York State. So another picture. You bang your finger with a hammer, you could probably go to the urgent care. Uh, but uh, if you cut some fingers off doing some uh, construction or a hammerhead shark, that might be the ER. <laughs> so East Long Island, we have the ER. Uh, we have psychiatry, we have detox, we have general surgery, and we have GI. We don't have um, ENT, OBGYN, pediatrics, and neurology. Um, so with those specialties, you will be seen, stabilized, at the hospital, and then we would probably have to transfer you to Stony Brook because we might not have the consultant that you would need to uh, continue your care. So like we were saying, so phone, we get phone calls all the time, what should I do? It's kind of, we want to give advice, but we can't uh, because we are not visually seeing you. So we don't want to give somebody the wrong advice and God forbid their finger bleeds and gets infected or the chest pain, it turns out to really be something bad. So our best bet is always to say you're more than welcome to come and be evaluated in the ER and uh, we'll take it from there. So what we're trying to do now is something called telemedicine. So if you do come to us and God forbid you're experiencing some signs of a stroke, they have something called telemedicine, which is like a, uh, a television where a neurologist would get on the phone, I mean on the TV, and physically see you and tell you to do all these tests where they're doing an evaluation. And then from there, they will give a recommendation if you should go to Stony Brook uh, to be seen uh, for an in-person neurological review. Some urgent cares are doing this now, not for neurological issues, but maybe for a rash or a cut because COVID, nobody wanted to go anywhere in person. So this um, technology sort of sprouted up from there. All right, any questions? Oh, thank you, thank you. Oh, great. Good. I am not a pure lay person. I think I've not had experience with real experience, but I think everything is coded. And 
I, that's what brought me to the emergency room. We have a problem here that I couldn't get a professional, a nurse or a doctor, to tell me this isn't a cold. I did have a television thing with a doctor who doesn't know me, and I told him I had a cold. He gave me a cough medicine, which you guys prescribed to me. He handled it well based on what I told him. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a cold. Right. My brother took me to the emergency room and said, this is ridiculous. I had RSV. Mm -hmm. They got it before it became pneumonia, but my lungs were affected. And um, now that's just the history of where I need, which isn't your problem, I need to have access to someone to say, this isn't a cold, get there. Now the real question I have, you're not gonna like. No. If I am at the emergency room and I need to be transferred to a hospital, must I go to Stony Brook? And I know it's an excellent hospital, but if you continue to Stony Brook, it's like $300 by taxi. Yes. So, that is a major problem, and I, wouldn't, I would rather go to Peconic Bay. So here's, here's my best knowledge of it. Um, so if a lot of people ask that question. So for us to transfer you to Stony Brook, let's say via ambulance, I think it's covered if it's considered what they call a higher level of care. It probably would be so in just, my case. So just let's say you needed, um, you needed to see an ear, nose, and throat, like emergently, which we don't have. That would be considered a higher level of care. <clears throat> so that should be covered by insurance. Now, if you want to go to Peconic Bay, let's say your doctor's there. Yes. We have to call your doctor, and then your doctor has to say, I will accept you at Peconic Bay. Okay. So anyway. then when we, I know it's very, um, it's something called Mtala. It's like a big rule. So if your doctor says, yes, I will accept patient Y, you could use my name. So when I call this transfer center, you see Dr. Smith is accepting patient Y, even though it might be a Stonybrook ambulance coming to get you, they could still take you to Peconic Bay. Okay, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> what would you do on a weekend? August happens on a weekend. The emergency room, oh, you mean your doctor or an urgent care? Or? Well, urgent cares are open. Um, they're open like maybe to 5 p.m. Um, but we're open 24 7. The emergency room is. So, yeah, but the urgent cares close around 5, I think. But the ER is always open, as well as Stony Brook is always open. Do you have access um, to our charts and records if they were from another hospital system? No. Many of us have moved out here from the city. My records are all at Mount Sinai. No, so they are working on that. It's something called, I think it's called Health, Health X or Health NY. So let's say um, Manhattan. I know if you go to Mount Sinai or NYU or any of those integrated you could get yes, you the could same get records. But no, we don't. What I would normally would do, like if you say, hey, I was just in, I don't know, Lutheran Hospital in Brooklyn last week, I would try to call them and uh, have you sign a waiver that I could get your information. And then they could fax it to me. Uh, but no, they're not integrated as of yet. Stony Brook is, though, like we were saying before. So if you're seeing with us or at Stony Brook, I could see your records, but not. Um, from other institutions. Yeah, I, I know. They're working on it, though. They are working on it. New York State, I mean, yeah. You made quite clear that your um, doctor would have to approve going to Paganic Bay, for instance. Yeah. I, yes. I am, my records are at Northwell, but my GP here is the GOM. So I would have to change my GP? No, no. Um, it's, so a lot of people don't want to go, uh, let's say, to X, Y, or Z, because they're not known there. So if push came to shove, I would have to call the ER doctor at the Comet Bay. Or let's say somebody wants to go to Southampton. Say, Mrs. X really wants to come there. Will you accept her? Nine times out of 10, it should be fine. But we, I can't just put somebody in an ambulance. So it's against the law just to put you in an ambulance and to show up. Right, yeah. 
It is. It is. <clears throat> Hi there. Um, as far as advanced directives are concerned, uh, obviously you start with the patient themselves and the family. Okay. Now the next step, do you need to have papers legally with a lawyer, like a DNR? Right. Um, okay. So what's the next step? if the patient and the family are in agreement with what they want to do? So, uh, unfortunately, if it ever came to that, um, let's say you didn't have papers on, uh, not you, but let's say somebody doesn't have papers. Mm -hmm. uh, in the ER, we have something called a MOLST form. So we would discuss with the patient and their family, what are your wishes? And we could fill it out right at the bedside. As well as some people might have it prior um, but we would need it. We would need it in hand. So if somebody's coming from the outside and we don't know what to do, we're always going to do what's best for the patient. Even though if somebody says, "Hey, I'm a DNR, DNI," we do need those papers to to verify, unless the family's there, and we could fill out that form all together and make sure everybody's in agreement. Uh, excuse me. Did you say a DNI? There's a DNI. What's the DNI? So, <clears throat> excuse me. So a DNR is do not resuscitate, right? A DNI is do not intubate, which means if your breathing gets worse, God forbid, do you want us to put a, a breathing tube in to help you breathe? Resuscitate means like CPR, medications through an IV, um, certain you know, um, monitors for your heart. But a DNI is specifically for the um, the breathing tube. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, good morning, Chris. Hi. <clears throat> uh, I had one question. Do you have the drug at Eastern Long Island for stroke? That's supposed to be administered. We do. You do have. We do. Oh, we do. I was. I had asked him there, and they said they weren't sure. No, we do. Oh, I'm sorry. I was uh, wondering whether they have that super drug that, when you have a stroke, I believe it's within three hours. It's four and a half. Now. Four and a half hours. It's four and a half, but there's um, there's parameters with that, right? So, if you're already on Coumadin or Eloquist is a relative, we can't give it because you could bleed. If you have a if you have what's called a hemorrhagic stroke right. versus an ischemic stroke, we can't give it. Oh. If, if your blood pressure is super high, we can't give it. So there's a whole bunch of windows. But we do have it. Okay, fine. Now yep. who makes the determination like right. the, uh, so, when they come to your home, let's say, to take you to the hospital, you call nine one one. Who makes the determination? What, what hospital you go to? The fire department fellow? Well, if it's, it, it's hard to say. So the, the paramedics kind of know what we have. I so if you're, if you're having a stroke right. within that period, yeah. they might choose to send you to the, I guess it's the most appropriate place, which would be Peconic Bay, okay. because they're a stroke center. I understand. But we do have the stroke medicine. So you might just say, Hey, my wrist is numb. Right. And they might not think anything of it, but that might be a stroke where you'll be seen by us. Well, I've had a stroke, so right. I guess I should tell that to the EMT. Oh, of possible. course. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Chris. You got it. I just wanted to say that it's my understanding that if you are taken by ambulance, your papers are taken from the front desk at Peconic Landing and go with you to the emergency room. So all the all the health information that we have that um, Peconic Landing has about you goes with you in the ambulance. Yes. Yeah, for the most part, um, from here, yes. But I'm speaking more. <clears throat> you know, if it's, uh, you know, God forbid you're out in the community and something happened. But yes, we usually do get your papers from here. Right. 
All right, thank you guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you.